Okay, good morning everyone and good morning to our students who are here online as well. Okay, let's begin this time with a word of prayer and we will pick up from where we stopped last class. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, once again to just come and learn together, Lord. We pray that Holy Spirit, you will speak to us even as we learn of God. We we pray, God, that you will, Lord, bring revelation into our hearts, that, uh, Lord, everything that we study, Lord, uh, that we will be able to learn and apply it in our lives. And, Lord, that you will continue to use each one of us, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right. So last class we did uh, chapter 6. We looked at uh, the teacher and Jesus as our example. Uh, most importantly, we looked at the nature of Jesus' teaching method. Uh, we saw that, uh, this, this is quickly go over that first one, we saw that he, he taught with authority, right? And everywhere we see when Jesus spoke, he spoke in authority. He was not confused of who he was, right? We picked up examples also, right? We saw that, uh, uh, you know, when, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees would come and ask him, on what authority are you doing what you're doing? He says, I'm doing it by my father's authority. But my father has given me this authority. Uh, and so nowhere we see Jesus confused or fearful, worried about what people will think. No, he thought with authority. And even the Pharisees and those who are listening to him, you know, uh, said, where did this man learn all of this from? Right? Where did he get such authority? How is he speaking in such authority? So we know that one of the ways that Jesus spoke was in authority. Two, well, Christ's method of teaching was he was speaking in love. Now, authority is good, right? It's good to you know be bold, be strong, be confident when we speak and teach. But we also need to undergird everything we do with love. Right, and the way the reason why Jesus went out, preached the gospel, preached and te taught people, and did these wonderful miracles, the reason for doing it is because why? Why did Jesus do all of this? To glorify God, okay, but why did he do it for people? Love. Because he loved them. Loved them, so he did it for them. It was not like Jesus was wanting something in return. Okay, now I will heal you. And then after I heal you, we meet near Solomon's col you know, colonnade or we meet tomorrow in this place. Please come for the meeting. Whatever he did, he did out of love. 3,000 people, he saw them. His heart was filled with compassion. When he saw the sick, the weary, his heart was filled with compassion. When he stood on, uh, you know, on the mountaintop and he looked over Jerusalem, his heart was filled with compassion. He was moved for the city of Jerusalem, right? So very, very important, uh, you know, especially in a time as this, it's very easy to forget love and to walk in authority, anointing, power, and all of, all of those other attributes. And then we forget love. No, love is the basis of our teaching and preaching of the gospel, right? So we should always remember that. Uh, three, his teaching was characterized with wisdom. Now, there were when Jesus walked, we, we learned last class, right? Jesus, he grew in wisdom and he also was able to, you know, there was a there was a combination. There was supernatural wisdom from the Holy Spirit. There was also the wisdom that he grew in, right? So what what do we mean by that? It was not like Jesus said, uh, you know, he, he was 10 years old and then he understood everything from the book of Isaiah. No, he learned it. And uh, you know, God gave him the wisdom to understand everything that he read. Uh, so wherever Jesus went, whatever he did, he walked in wisdom. Whenever he spoke, he spoke with wisdom. There are some places he spoke, he answered people. There are some places he chose not to answer people. And this is one of the important characteristics of wisdom. Wisdom, Solomon writes, he says, wisdom listens. Knowledge speaks. Right. So sometimes it's also to take a step back. Uh, and, and also when we teach and preach, especially when it comes to teaching, 
ask God for wisdom. Ask God, okay, God, if I want to teach and I, I, I have something that I plan to teach, give me the wisdom how to communicate it. Now, just having the revelation is good, but we also need to communicate that in the right way. So then there comes wisdom. Right, the wisdom of God. Then we saw that Jesus' ministry was combined with the supernatural ministry. He taught, he preached, then he did the miracles. Right, uh, uh, It was not just on word, but it was also in demonstration and in power. Most importantly, Jesus used figurative languages, that is metaphors, figures of speech, hyperboles like exaggerations, remember? It's easier for a camel to go into the eye of a needle. And then parables. So we stopped at parables. We looked at what is parables. It's an earthly story with heavenly meaning. And, and um, it's an extended figure of speech uh, just to communicate and bring out a point. And Jesus used a lot of parables. Think of this. You know, Jesus is teaching and maybe some of them are falling asleep. I've been listening for hours and falling asleep. And then suddenly Jesus says, let me tell you a story. Everyone are up. Yeah, what's the story about? Right. So what happens is he knew how to capture the audience. It was not like Jesus was standing there and saying, I am the son of God. I was sitting next to the father. I am part of the father. Now I'm come here. I'm going to keep teaching. You have to keep listening. No, he knew that people are tired. He knew that people are, you know, weary and it's the whole day, it's not easy. But he had ways, I'm sure, I'm sure, right? He would bring up these parables just to illustrate truth, right? In some places it was to illustrate truth, in some places it was to obscure the truth from people. So we looked at one area of the parables that Jesus spoke of, the lostness, right? The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. So uh the main topic in all of these three parables was the lostness of man and how God, in his mercy, extends his hands of grace to close that gap between God and man. What sin that we have committed has separated us from God, but and the lostness of man has caused us to go our own way. And so all three parables brought out that same element of the lostness of man, yet God in his mercy called us forth, brought us closer to him, right? Um, and, the, and the joy in you and I being believers in Christ. So let's look at a few more themes uh, of other parables that Jesus taught. Now, it's important that we, uh, the reason we want to focus on this is because when you and I teach, many of you may go back and you may get opportunities to teach or to preach, we must understand these parables, right? And you may get an opportunity to, you know, prepare in one of these. So you can pick it up, you can prepare and teach. So let's just take our time in this, uh, the themes and other parables Jesus taught. So number one, A, we'll talk about forgiveness. Now, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life so the point of that whole verse was forgiveness i'm coming i'm going to die on the cross and i'm going to forgive your sins that was the whole point right so how did jesus communicate forgiveness to his audience luke chapter 7 verses 41 and 43 let's read that luke 7 41 and 43 go ahead anyone can read that Luke 7, 41 to 43. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he cancelled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt cancelled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Yeah. So, again, here Jesus is talking about debts that have been uh, cleared off, talking about forgiveness, right? He just 
bringing in that example one person had so such an amount of debt uh, you know he owed 500 dinars the other 50 right so if you look at it it's like jesus is bringing out this parable and saying the money is like the sin that we have made he's not saying money is sin the 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 point that he's trying to bring across, across is that one person had what 50 500 dinars and the other 50 but the money lender you know waved off both of them's loan and said okay i don't want you to pay it back it's okay it's all forgotten let it go you are no longer in debt now who is so now which of them will love him more the one who gave 500 dinars or 50 dinars 500 why he had a larger debt and it would have probably taken him more time to cover that up more effort more time more hard work um, and it would have been you know even more difficult than that of the 50 dinars and the point that jesus is bringing here he's saying sin is like that when we are in when people who are in sin who are in greater sin you know they've, they've lived a completely sinful life and the moment they come to jesus they find forgiveness whether it is a thousand sin whether it's hundred sin it's the same your sins are forgiven your debt is cleared what an amazing you know way of bringing this across now think of this jesus is sitting and he's talking to to people about this now during those days money lending was a common thing right they would lend money take it back on interest so jesus is sitting saying this I don't know if they would have thought that his audience would have thought he's talking about sin. But some of them may have got it. That's where it comes here. He spoke in parables to illustrate truths and also to obscure truths from people. Right. So let's go to the next one. Um, Matthew chapter 18, 23 and 24. Matthew 18, 23 and 24. <laughs> Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Yeah, let's just continue reading that so that okay. we get the... Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I cancelled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Very plain and simple. But what a beautiful way of communicating a message and a truth. There was a king. This, this servant owed 10,000 denarius to the king. He says, King says, okay, you got to pay back. It's time. The servant says, no, master, I don't have that much kind of money. Please have mercy on me. King says, okay, today I'm in a good mood, so I'm going to cancel your debt. Forget about paying it back. You don't have to pay it back. It's canceled. 10,000 dinars, go. You're free to go. Now, this servant goes and meets his other friend, who's also a fellow servant, and says, hey, you owe me 100 dinars. The other servant says, oh, oh, you know, hey, just give me some time. I'll pay you back. Servant says, no. And puts him into prison, gets him uh, into trouble. 
And eventually the master gets to know about it. Now, what a response. The master says, you are a wicked man because I forgave your debt. I, I, I canceled your debt. Couldn't you have done the same thing to your fellow brethren there? Right? And what a powerful truth. Jesus ends it by saying, this is how my heavenly father will treat each one of you unless you forgive one another from your heart. Now, I like that word, from your heart. We can pretend to forgive, but that's where God comes into place. God's word is the discerner of our heart. Right? He, you know, Hebrews 4.12 says, dividing every in our soul, our spirit, you may say I have forgiven him, but his word can bring out the truth and we know that we have not forgiven. Right? He discerns our heart. I, you know, uh, that's why I always say the prayer that David made was one of the most dangerous prayers where he said, Lord, search my heart and know my thoughts. Can we pray that? Uh, sometimes I'm scared to pray that. <laughs> Lord, search my heart. I don't know what's in my heart. I don't know what's in my thoughts. Unless I go back and say, God, cleanse my heart, cleanse my thoughts, wash me with your blood, forgive me for the things that I've said, done, thought. And then when I receive that forgiveness, then I can say, Lord, cleanse my heart. But David in the Old Testament is saying, Lord, search my heart. You wonder why God called him the man after my own heart? He committed one of the Seven deadly sins, as mentioned in the Old Testament. Adultery, it was, a, it was a deadly sin. But God is saying, he's a man after my own heart. Why? Because he, 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 he knew where he was standing. He was willing to forgive. And he, he knew that God would also forgive him. Right? And so forgiveness is a key. And Jesus thought about it. So, for example, you know, you and I get opportunities and we're going to teach about forgiveness. Use these examples, right? use these parables, build on it, like how you learn in homiletics, right? Um, bring in these examples, these truths, these uh, from the word of God, and then build on your teaching material, right? Let's go to the next one. Generosity, Luke chapter 12, 16 through 22. Is Jesus a generous person? Yes. Is God generous to us? Yes. Very much. And he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and eat, build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples. Uh, no, that, that's, that's, that's fine. Till verse 21. Yeah. Now, this is the parable of the rich fool. <laughs> You see how Jesus is talking here? Imagine, imagine his audience. He's got these rich Pharisees. Maybe some of them are Romans. They're rich, right? Tax collectors were very rich, right? And he's saying, let me tell you a parable about a rich fool, right? And he, he gives this whole example. You know what? I'm, my fields are doing so well. I'm going to get a good harvest. So, But my barn is too small. So what I'm going to do is break down this small barn build a bigger barn so that whatever harvest I get, I can save it up, right? And then when the time is right, I will sell it, I'll be rich. I'll be richer than what I am already. Because Jesus starts off by saying the parable of the rich fool. He's already rich, but his heart is in making more money. His heart is not in giving to others. Remember the other parable, uh, other not, not parable, but the uh, but the story where uh, Jesus goes, he's walking, and Zacchaeus is sitting on the tree, and um, uh, Zacchaeus was again a tax collector, and uh, Jesus says, "Come down, Zacchaeus. We're going to have food in your place." 
If they go together, they have food. And Zacchaeus comes, he brings all his money, puts it there and says, I'm done with this. Take, whoever wants to take, take. I'm going to give everything that I have. Right? What does Jesus say? Salvation has come into this house. But then he follows it up with some, some more detail. Right? Uh, but what's the point here? Generosity. Jesus is, now, we must understand context here. See, the rich fool, the rich man here, why is Jesus calling him a fool? Is it wrong to prepare and plan for the future? No. Right? The, the man is planning for the future. He's planning for the things ahead. You know, this this is not this this barn is too small. I need to build a bigger one. Nothing wrong with it. He's using his wisdom and he's trying to say, okay, when the harvest comes, I want to have place there. So I'm building a bigger one. What's wrong in that? I would have probably asked that question if I was standing there. Jesus, what is wrong with this? Nothing wrong with it. He's planning to build a bigger one so that he can put up all his harvest in there. He's being wise. Why are you calling him a fool? Now, that's why I always think about the audience, right? They didn't ask good questions <laughs> in Jesus' ministry. I wish I was there. I would have asked some good questions. <laughs> we should learn to ask good questions. Whose face do you see on the coin? Caesar's. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. I said, what belongs to God? I'd ask some, some good question. These people were not prepared. Right? If you have to corner somebody, you should have good questions. But anyways, here, I would have said, nothing wrong in this. He's planning, he's preparing. You yourself has, you have talked about you know, being prepared. But here, God is looking at the heart of this person. He's calling this parable, this rich man a fool, because he's putting all his heart, his life into that harvest. He's putting all his hope, his trust into that harvest. God is not saying it's wrong to become rich. The Lord is not focusing on the richness. He's focusing here on the heart. He's saying this man, he's already rich, but he's storing up riches more for himself instead of being generous to others. What he can do is give to others, give to the poor, give to the needy, and have sufficient of what he has. So Jesus is responding and saying, you know, God looks from heaven and says, you fool. If I would, you know, what if I expect you, what if I ask of your life tomorrow itself? You don't know what your life is. What does he say there? But God said to him, you fool, this very night, this very night, your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Right. So, so Jesus is he's speaking into the heart here. He's saying, this man is already rich. He's storing up, storing up riches for him on earth. But he's not willing to be generous to others. And he's looking at the future ahead. He's forgetting that God, I can ask him for his life even today, tonight. So the point of the parable is be willing to give to people. Be willing to give to the Lord. Be generous. right? Uh, give. Now, when I say give, you know, uh, especially in a time that we are in, sometimes, you know, uh, ministries are scared to say give because of what is happening. Or all these uh, sad things that are happening around us globally as well. But when we are generous and when we give what we have to give to either to others, to God, God is the one who will, you know, continue to manifold his blessings, right? It's, he says in his word, he will, it's pressed down and overflowing, shaken and overflowing. Now, I would tell you, I can share many testimonies where you just be generous and small things god will give you things that you wouldn't have even imagined right and and so it's very important to keep a heart in the right place where your treasure is that's where your heart is so the point of this parable was to give now it's not wrong to plan all of you are going back home going back maybe after your bible college Go back to your hometowns. You have to plan, 
okay, I'm going to work or I'm going to work and do ministry or I'm going to start my own church, whatever God is calling you for. You have to plan. We're learning this in the local church, right? We have to plan. But as you plan, remember who's in control of everything. Sometimes you can put aside Jesus and say, Jesus, I'll call you back once the ministry is around 45 to 50 people. Then I would need your help to, you know, to go up to about 100, 200 people. For now, I'll handle what I have to do. Listen, God is saying, if I want, I can even stop you from doing what you're doing. I can, ex I can expect of your life even tonight. What can we do? Nothing we can do. Right? Now, this parable was not to bring fear. It was to, Jesus is saying this to set our hearts right before God. Align ourselves. Whatever you do, be generous, right? Just a, you know, just an example. And uh, okay, I'm just going to use this as an example of KFC, right? Colonel Sanders. At an old age, he started all of this, and he wrong day, right? Fasting prayer today, but anyways. Uh, at an old age, he started all of this, and uh, you know, he this whole thing and. Uh, this business of uh, fried chicken and and it it grew so big and he became a millionaire over you know very very quickly started many centers here but he gave almost 90 percent of his income to missions to churches to building of schools almost 90 percent of his income now here's here's what uh, he said to one reporter he said i i went through extreme poverty where i didn't have anything i was suicidal my wife left me i had no money i had no prospects i had nothing with me i didn't know when my next food will come from and here god takes this person gives him an idea to start this you know the center does this and now god has blessed me how can i keep it all to myself and so he the more he gave the more profits were coming in for him. So he didn't, he, for him, it was like, what is happening? Whatever I'm getting as an organization, as a business, it's just each year, it's going higher and higher and higher. Right? And that was, a, uh, you know, the interviewer was like, why don't you save up for or do something else? He said, no, my, it's not the point of this business was not to make money because I was suicidal. So I was going to end my life. God gave me this idea. I did it. So my heart is not on the money. My heart is in a place of rest saying that God did something in my life where I'm leaving a mark in this world. Money has nothing to do with it. He just gives away everything. Right? Now, we may think, okay, it's old. It's easy. No, it's not easy. You become a millionaire and you'll know that it's not easy, right? But generosity is very important. Well, it's one of the attributes that we must walk in. Three, humility. Let's go. Uh, let's read Luke chapter 14, 7 through 14. Now, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. This then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now tell me, has this ever happened to any one of you? You've gone to a meeting, a conference, or a wedding, and you go right in front and sit. 
and all of a sudden one of them comes and says can you please move because this place is for the bride's family or the groom's family right and that's embarrassing right jesus is bringing a point here he's saying when you go into certain places no matter how great you may feel you are learn to be humble learn to take a back seat learn to stay away right let people appreciate who you are right and uh, it's a very important principle we talk about humility we talk about walking in authority right the first point was jesus walked in authority but he also walked in humility he didn't feel it you know, the scriptures teach us that he was obedient to death even death on a cross it was a humiliating experience to die on a cross jesus didn't decide to finish it by just you know just a quick death no the cross was the most offensive death even a leper had more integrity than a person who was crucified on the cross lepers were given more value than a person who died on a cross and here you see jesus even in his earthly ministry he was willing to speak to the woman the samaritan woman he walked in humility he didn't say okay why well, who are you to talk to me you are a samaritan no nothing jesus was willing to talk to the roman centurion he didn't say you people are taking uh, so much of tax from us uh, you bring your uh, you know your servant or or uh, you know you come back after two days no. walked in humility and the ultimate sign of humility was when jesus washed the feet of his disciples and he said servant is not greater than his master now from what we read here towards the end verse 11 he says for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted humility that is you know, in leadership i think one of the first points we talk about is humility pride is is one attribute that can come in very 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 subtly into our lives we want to even know it and we want to know we're walking in pride and so sometimes we, uh, you know we'll have to tell ourselves hey you know just learn know who you are everything that i am everything that we are i'm doing is by the grace of god we have to tell ourselves because why did lucifer the enemy fall from heaven the pride of life he said i want to go and be seated on the same throne that god the father is seated on there's no difference between we both now what what happened as an angel he was given all authority you know the worship leader of the host of heavens the book of i think uh, ezekiel talks about how he is psalms also talks about how how when he spreads out his wings tambourines would would play and he was like the head of the cherubims great angel he forgot one thing he was created by god he forgot that slowly pride took, took over and it led to his fall so the same scenario for us sometimes god can use us god will use us he will give us opportunities and all of a sudden we'll see ourselves going higher and higher and higher that is where we need to keep a check and say okay it's okay to be it's okay not to be known it's okay to be you know in a place of uh you know obscurity and i i'm going to share this example but uh, but there's a point there's a reason i'm sharing this in the old testament right uh, elisha and gehaz uh, elisha and gehazi are um, elisha's a prophet there in in israel and you know, remember that story naman has leprosy right now who tells naman do we know her name the girl that little girl now elisha has never healed anyone before he has never healed anyone of forget leprosy he's never healed anyone before no one's ever been healed of leprosy and this little girl is saying listen i know a prophet in israel 
he will cleanse your lep leprosy. Go to him. Now look at the faith of this little girl. Now the Bible does not even mention who the name of that little girl is, but I think she's the she's the star in that whole story. If it wasn't for her, nothing would have happened. Naman would have just died in his leprosy. But it's a little girl. Sometimes, you know, the Bible does these things so that we must understand certain things. Right? It's not always that we must be in the picture for everything. I learn to step back. Yes, God will open doors. You step into those doors. But there are times you'll have to just humble yourself and say, it's OK. It's OK. Let me give others the opportunity. Or let them increase. Let me decrease. Right? So uh, Jesus spoke on this. Imagine Jesus dying on the cross. And they say, if you're really the Messiah, come down from the cross. Oh, Jesus should have just done it. Sometimes I feel he should have just said, OK, Michael, come. Could have done it. But he chose not to do it. Obedient to death, even death on a cross. Right? OK, next one. Judgment. He spoke on judgment. This is, I think, uh, the most he spoke on uh, judgment. Matthew chapter 25, 31. Or oh, let's read Luke 13, uh, 6 through 9, just so that we can do as much as we can. Luke 13, 6 through 9. So we'll just pick up one example from each. Then he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man, who took care of the vineyard? For three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Yeah. What is the point of this parable? Listen to you. you so we just read it. It, it. it feels like you know this man is uh, the the master of the 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 place is like he's in a hurry. He wants to eat the fruit of the fig tree. It feels like hurriness. But it's not. The point of this is repent. It could be a little bit of a hurriedness uh, added in this story, but it was more of repent or perish. Repent of your sins or perish. Now, this fig tree, it's been many years. The master comes and says, it's been so many years. I've been wanting to eat fig from this fig tree, but now it's been three years. Nothing has happened. It's, taking, it's a waste of space. Let's cut it down. Let's put another uh, plant there. But another person, the, um, the person who was looking after the vineyard said, Master, let's leave it for one more year. We'll dig around it. We'll water it. And we'll see. By next year, if it does not bear fruit, we'll cut it down. Now, it was more like uh, the, the story is like saying, there is a time. God will bring judgment on the sins that we may commit. Now, when we turn back to God and repent of our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. But the more we turn away from God, turn away from Him, say, God is like, you know, trying to call us, He's calling, trying to draw us to Him. But the more we just turn aside and say, No, I don't want you, I don't want to believe in you, I don't trust your word, I, I don't believe in this, the more we go the other way, God is like saying, I'll give you another year. Now, the, the word year is basically some more time. I'll give you time. Right? He's patient with us. He gives us time. He gives us time. He gives us time. And when we don't see repentance, uh, we will perish. Meaning, God will just let his hand out. God is a good God, but he will not override our will. He will draws to him he will woo, woo us he will try to you know bring in the pressure through people but if we keep saying no to god we will be cut down so that was the point of this whole parable repent or perish there'll come a time and you will have to stand before god and give a reason for what you did right then we'll go to the kingdom uh, kingdom 
parables and there are many 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 kingdom parables that jesus spoke of matthew 13 has quite a few of them let's go to matthew 13. Um, uh, so we'll not read all of this, but let's just, uh, I'll just just pick up a few here. The parable of the sower, we all know the story, right? Now, uh, some seeds, the kingdom of God is like this. Some fell on rocky places, some fell on thorns, some fell on good soil. Um, and this is what happened. So when Jesus is, when the disciples said, tell us what you meant by this, verse 19 onwards, he says, uh, listen to this parable. When anyone hears this, the kingdom, the message about the kingdom and does not understand it. So here he's talking about the kingdom of God. The parable of weeds, again, the kingdom of heaven he's talking about. The parables of mustard seed and yeast, uh, the kingdom of heaven. Parable of weeds, explained. Okay. The parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl, which is, again, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure that is hidden in a field. The parable of the net. Um, the kingdom of heaven is like a net which was let down, right? So you see all these parables that Jesus spoke in, kingdom parables. That means what? He's talking about the kingdom that is that is yet to come, his kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, right? Which is opposite to the to the world that we live in, right? And, and so he's he's bringing out principles from all of these, right? Then he talks about the law, principles or parables from the law. Uh, in Matthew 9, 16, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 16. Yes, anyone can read that? Matthew 9, 16. Mm. Matthew 9, verse 16. No one puts a piece of uncertain cloth on a, an old garment, for the patch pulls away the, from the garment and the tear is made worse. Go on. Uh. Nor do they put one new wine into old wine skin, or else the wine skins break, the wine is spilled, and the wine skins are run. But they put new wine into a new wine skins, and both are preserved. Mm. Now, this answer is a response to a question that John's disciples asked Jesus. So John's disciples come to Jesus and ask, Jesus, tell us this. The Pharisees are all fasting and praying and doing all they're doing. But here we are eating and drinking and enjoying ourselves. right? So why are we doing this? So Jesus says, he's responding to them and says, no one sues a patch of unstrung cloth and an old garment. He gives this whole example. The point is, he's saying, I've come so that you will, I will establish a new covenant, a new law. I've not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill it. And when the moment I fulfill this, there's a new covenant I will establish. So it's not going to be old wine in, in, in new wineskins, but it's going to be new wine in new wineskin. You get what he was trying to bring out there? Right? He's saying it's not about the law. It's not, it's good. The law is good. Right? And I am the I am going to fulfill that, but I'm doing something new. There's, I'm not going to take old cloth and stitch it to a new uh I'm sorry, I'm not going to take a new piece of cloth and stitch it to an old garment, but I'm going to take a new cloth for new garment. So bringing out the whole thing of law. But again, they did not understand it, right? So in many places, Jesus talks about the law, right? Uh, now, he's not against the law, remember, right? He is the law. He's come to fulfill it, but he's saying, I'm giving you something better. Don't go by the old covenant. Don't go by what Moses and Abraham did. Jesus says, you know, John the Baptist says, God can raise up, you know, oh, children of Abraham from these stones. So don't stand on that law. Stand on what I'm going to do. A greater covenant, a new covenant with better promises is what I'm going to give you. So he, in all these verses, he, he talks about this new covenant. Then he talks about the Lord's return, parables of the return. There's so many. Matthew chapter 24, uh, Luke 12. Let's just look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24, he's talking about the signs of the end times. Uh, and he, yeah, he's talking about signs of the end times. He's talking a, a day when uh, the day and the hour is unknown. Matthew 25, he's bringing in a parable of the 10 virgins, talking about readiness. Uh, you know, at, at the time, the 10 virgins who took up their lambs, five of them were foolish, five of them were wise, five of them had 
everything ready. Five of them were not ready. So he's talking about readiness, right? Readiness. Uh, uh, again, in Luke 12, Luke 12, uh, this is, uh, sorry, Luke, is that Luke 12? Yeah, Luke 12, 42 onwards. Right. Yeah. Who then is a faithful and a wise, uh, wise manager who puts in charge? So basically, he's talking about the wise manager who made sure that they were able to, you know, save up. They were able to, uh, you know, look towards the future and be ready for anything to expect for. Okay, next one quickly before we close. Mercy. He spoke a lot about mercy. Parables on mercy. Luke ten, thirty to thirty seven. Uh, again, this is the. Uh, a parable of uh, the Good Samaritan. We all know the story, yes? The Good Samaritan is talking about mercy. And Jesus is bringing out the whole aspect of you can have the law, you can have all these, uh, you know, all these people coming and greeting you and doing all these things, but if you have mercy, if you don't have mercy, there's no value in it, right? You may be high in society, but don't forget to have value. That's why Jesus used the example of, when he was using this example, he said, he, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, he used a pro he used a Pharisee and he used a scribe. He used two well-known people, people of high, uh, you know, high place in society, but they had no mercy. So Jesus is bringing out the parable of mercy. Luke eleven is the parable on prayer, where uh, you know persistence. Right, talking about persistence. So he's saying. See, don't look 11, 5 through 8. Uh, then he said, suppose one of you has a friend and he goes to him at midnight. Friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine uh, on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is locked and my children with me in bed. I can't give, sorry, I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because of his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. It's like Jesus is saying, it's just a simple parable, right? But Jesus is bringing out the point of persistency. And when you and I are persistent in prayer, God is going to give it. It's not like God is saying, be more persistent. He's not you know, taunting us in he wants us to become persistent in prayer. God, I want this, and I know that you can do this. Tell me how to do it. I'm not going to let go of you. I'm going to hold on to you. And I remember, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jacob, he, he said, I'm going to hold on to you. Until you bless me, I'm not going to let you go. Something like that, persistent in prayer. So he used uh, parables, and, and there are many more examples. But, but the point of all of these is, these parables illustrated truth, brought out what God, what Jesus wanted to communicate in a very meaningful manner. He brought it out. Um, and so you and I, as, as we get opportunities to teach, we can use these examples. We can come up with our own illustrations. And even as we do that, make sure that our illustrations are small, good illustrations, the right illustrations in the right, right place, we're able to capture uh, the audience that we are ministering to. All right? All right. Any questions? Any thoughts? Okay. All right. So we'll close and then we will meet uh, next class and we'll continue from Jesus, the teacher in the, sorry, the teacher in the early church. And we look at examples on how the ministry of the teacher just continued to grow here. Right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good week, weekend. See you next week. God bless.